Let's jump into the Word today. I'm going to preach a message that I would title, When the Hedge Comes Down. Uh, there was a teacher at a school, it was around Thanksgiving time, and she asked the students to write something that they were thankful for on, for Thanksgiving. And so they'd gone through, and you know, the kids said different things. I'm thankful for my parents. Some were thankful for their toys, some for their siblings, different things like that. And one boy finally said game to him, and he said, well, I'm thankful that I'm not a turkey on Thanksgiving. And uh, I, maybe that's a good thing to be thankful for. You ever heard the, the expression, there's always somebody who has it worse than you? Well, you know, that there's something about that phrase that has, has irked me or bothered me a little bit over time. And I want to I wanna ask you the question, what if you were that person? In other words, what if you were the person who had it worse than anybody else? You couldn't say of your own situation, your own circumstances, well, at least there's somebody, I know there's somebody worse off than I am. What if you were that person at the bottom of the heap uh, that, uh, that was ab- absolutely the worst situation, the worst circumstances, everything that was worse? Could you still be thankful? Uh, could you be thankful even if you're the turkey, in other words? Could you still be thankful? Let's turn to the book of Job. That's a good place to start when, it, when, when speaking about the bottom of the barrel, if you will, or the worst potentially a potential situation that, that's conceivable. Uh, let's, let's look at Job chapter 1, and we'll begin at the first verse. Job chapter 1. Would you stand with me as we read God's Word? Job's in the Old Testament. It's after Esther and before Psalms and, and Proverbs in your Old Testament. So if you open your book, right, uh, the Bible right in the middle, you'll probably end up in Psalms, and then just turn a little bit toward the beginning, and you'll find Job. Job chapter 1 beginning at the first verse. Let's read the word together. Job chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. What a great description. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the east. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all, For Job said, It may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. Now there was, verse 6, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? Then Satan, listen to this, Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, may your spirit speak through your word. And though we're reading about uh, Job and uh, some some uh, a situation surrounding him and he lived thousands of years ago and yet god we believe lord that you can speak truth and life to us today in the hour in which we live god that this truth can impact us and shape our lives we pray that it would do so through the power of your holy spirit in jesus name we pray amen amen you can be seated well, verse 1's a good description. I think that'd be a good description of anybody. In fact, it's, it's in there twice in verse 1 and verse 8. It says, that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away 
from evil. It wasn't that evil was not an option for him. It wasn't that evil wasn't a temptation for him, but he turned away from evil. He had a fear of God that was a healthy fear, by the way. He was blameless. He was upright. And the question that comes before the Lord as Satan enters in to question and to challenge is in verse 9. He says, does Job fear God for no reason? Well, obviously there's, a, there's going to be a reason. There's always a why as to why do we do the things that we do? Why do we have at the attitude that we have? Why do we say the things that we say? There's always a, a question of why. And this is what the enemy is asking. Does God, Job... Uh, does Job fear God for no reason? In other words, what's the motivation that Job has? His implication uh, uh, and this challenge is really the thesis for the whole book. In fact, you can read on, all, every chapter of Job is uh, dealing with this very question that, that, that Satan asks nonetheless. Now, the question itself is not a necessarily an evil question. Now, for Satan asking the question, the question is he has a proposed answer in that as well. Uh, what is Job's motivation? And the enemy is saying Job has motivation and the motivation is twisted. It's wrong. He's, he's serving you, God, because he knows if he doesn't, he won't have any blessings. So his motivation is really based on greed of earthly treasure, earthly motivations. His motivation in serving, fearing you, turning away from evil is not good. It's not a positive one. In fact, it goes on to highlight in verse 10, have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. Now that, that phrase, by the way, there, this hedge of protection, that's where we get that phrase. Have you ever heard somebody pray that? Lord, put a hedge of protection around so and so, or give us a hedge of protection as we travel, whatever that might look like. That's where that terminology comes from and uh, uh, the hedge there uh, has to do with a level of protection almost like a barrier a fence uh, uh, some kind of wall of protection that he refers to as this hedge and what satan is saying to god is is the only reason really that job is serving you the only reason that he's blameless the only reason he's upright the only reason he fears you the only reason that he uh he turns away from evil is because you've protected him you've given him a level of security in other words his service to you his personal righteousness his personal holiness is dependent upon your physical and blessings of wealth and protection that's the reason why and if his hedge were to come down then he would curse you if his hedge of protection were to come down he would not honor or serve you he would fall into the base kind of responses of fallen humanity he would not act or live holy he would not be righteous he would not be blameless or upright in any way he would turn to sin immediately if the hedge came down. That's the whole question of the book of Job is, can you still serve God? Will you still love the Lord even if his hedge of blessing and protection is removed? That's a powerful question. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. You know, we are a people that are so blessed that we take so much for granted until it starts to leave us. You know, I've, I, being a pastor, I've seen a lot of people, unfortunately, who have walked away from the faith because things became difficult, because things in the church didn't turn out the way that they wanted to them, things in life, and, and, uh, and things just, just didn't take place the way that they wanted them to take place. And so because the hedge, hedge if you will, was removed, they didn't operate in the same way they had before. Job gives us an example. The question that I want you to think about today is what if you didn't have all the things that you have now? Would you still serve the Lord? What if you suffered loss in your family? What if your life crumbled around you? What if your job was taken away from you? What if you lost your health? Job was that guy who suffered loss. He dealt with 
with uh, discouragement. He dealt with rejection. His family, well, he lost his family. He lost his finances. He lost his own physical health. He lost his friends rejected him. And they told him, you've done wrong. That's why you don't have a hedge of protection. And uh, all those things. He was hurting. He was forlorn. He was no doubt if anybody had a reason to walk away from it all. It was Job. And yet Job remained upright through it all. He remained upright. Let me give you a few things Job did not do. Number one, Job did not become bitter. He didn't become bitter. He loses his children in verses 13 after where we stopped. Uh, uh, it begins immediately. The enemy begins to, to take advantage of the situation. And, and uh, he loses his children. His children, are they die in a, in, a, in a difficult situation. And then listen to what it says in verse 20 of chapter 1. It says, Then Job arose, he tore his robe, he shaved his head, he fell on the ground and worshipped. Do you know what that tells me? That tells me that no matter what the circumstances are in your life, you can still worship God. You can praise Him. You can lift up the name of Jesus even when you're suffering loss. One of the very uh, lies of the enemy that's twisted our ability to worship the Lord and uh, to, to experience victory in our spiritual walk with God is the fact that you can still worship God even when you suffer from loss. See, Job did not become bitter. Bitter, no doubt... Bitterness was no doubt a temptation because he had just lost uh, his children. Their, their lives had been taken away, and, uh, and it was a temptation, no doubt. But instead of bitterness, he worshiped. I, that's let me tell you today. Worship of God is the choice that you will have to make somewhere along your spiritual journey to say, you know what? I choose to worship Jesus. I choose to worship the living God. Job said in, in verse 21, right after he chose to worship, he says, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We sing that song sometimes. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He gives and takes away. You know, sometimes we feel, oh, that's not something really you worship. I don't, I'll, I'm good when he gives, but I'm not good when he takes away. But he is a God who's worthy to be praised when he gives, when he takes away. When he gives position, when he takes away position. When he gives earthly blessings, and when he takes away earthly blessings. When he gives relationships when he takes away relationships. He is still worthy to be praised and worshipped. And that's what Job did rather than fall into bitterness. Yes, he was distraught. He had lost. He was hurt. He had lost his children. And he tore his robes and he shaved his head and he fell down on his face and he said, I know what to do in times of plenty and times of loss. I will worship the living God. I'll still worship you give and take away, you give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. We don't tend to be programmed this way. Uh, this isn't always something that comes natural for us. But Job didn't become bitter. Rather, Job worshipped the Lord. Another thing that happened, Job didn't lose his integrity. In verse 22, uh, where we read, it says, In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. In all this, he didn't, he didn't sin, he didn't have a wrong action, he didn't uh, allow things to play out in his mind. No doubt he was tempted in his thought processes and questioning God and, and wondering about things. In fact, the book of Job is full of the questions that Job had. But his questions didn't come from a level of animosity. They came from a genuine desire that he had to understand what was going around. See, he didn't understand what was going on in his life. All he knew is he was suffering loss. But he never charged God with wrong. In Job chapter 2, we find that uh, uh, Job was, uh, uh, that, that that desire, that attitude wasn't shared by Job's wife. In chapter 2, verse 9, it says, Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. In other words, what he's saying is, 
you know, we have received so much good from God. Did you expect that we would go through life and nothing bad would ever happen to us? In other words, did you expect that we would never receive some evil thing happening in our lives? Loss of children, loss of finances, loss of job, loss of property, loss of whatever it might be. Did you expect that? He's saying to his wife, you have become so accustomed to the blessings of God that you would curse God in the midst of some loss. And he's saying, I'm not going to do it. In fact, the Bible says he never sinned with his lips. He never sinned against God with his lips. Who, what kind of person are you when the pressure's on, when you feel like things are being ripped out from underneath of you in your life, when you feel like things that are going on are too difficult to bear? What kind of person are you? You see, Job was the kind of person whose faith was deeper than the things that he could touch and feel and possess. They were deeper than the things of this world. When you're at the end of the rope, what kind of a person are you? What kind of a man? What kind of a woman are you when you come to the end of your rope? Job was the kind of person who said, I'm not going to curse God. Job was the kind of person who was going to say, I'm going to continue to be faithful to the Lord. Job did not lose his integrity. Who he was in the good times is the same person that he was in the difficult times. Hard day, hard life, continue to be faithful to the Lord. Number three, something that Job didn't give up. He didn't give up on God. Job had a tenacity about him. He had, uh, he had uh, kind of the resolve of a pit bull. You know, when they get a hold of something, he was not going to, he was resolved. He had decided to follow the Lord. He had decided to follow and honor the Lord, the God of the universe, the creator of all things. Whether he understood everything that was going on or not, uh, did not change the fact that he was going to serve the Lord. I read, uh, 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 I read some of it already, but in Job chapter 1, verse 21, he says, Naked I came from my mother's womb, naked shall I return. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. He did not give up. And whether God gives or God takes away, I'm going to serve him. I'm going to bless his name. Job chapter 2, verse 10. And he said to his wife, when she said, just curse God and die. What a supportive spouse, right? Just give up on this endeavor of honoring and serving the Lord. He says, you speak as one foolish woman would speak. Shall we receive good from God? Shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Job chapter 14, verse 7. He said, for there is hope for a tree. If it be cut down, that it will sprout again, and that its shoots will not Cease. In other words, he said, in the midst of all my loss, I know that there is still hope. There is still a God that I will not let go of in the midst of this storm. He will see me through. Hallelujah. Job chapter 19, beginning of verse 25. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself and my eyes shall behold and not another my heart faints within me there's a hope beyond this world that he recognized we need some people who have the kind of resolve that job had to say i am not going to give up in my relationship with the living god we need some people to say i'm going to run this race all the way to the end and if everything goes well then so be it blessed be the name of the lord but if things do not go well if things are difficult i will continue to run the race set before me all the way to heaven where my savior is see this race that we run in life is not a sprint it's not a temporary thing it's a, it's a marathon it's a race of endurance I, i've uh, described before and often do i describe uh, uh, p some people as what we call i would call firework christians there's, there's a big to do oh they're going to serve the lord oh they're going to honor jesus oh they're going to do all these great things for the kingdom and you know what happens it's a flash in the pan and they fade away because they have not resolved in their heart whether it's easy whether it's difficult whatever comes my way i will serve the lord job 13 15 though he slay me i will hope in him yet i will argue my ways to his, even if he slays me 
wow, he's not going to give up. Are you willing to endure? Are you willing to face the circumstances and the situations of life that will come your way, the circumstances and the situations that will, will resist your forward momentum spiritually? Are you willing to move forward with the Lord? Job didn't understand his situation. He couldn't figure it all out. It was contrary to his theology. It was certainly, if you read the, through the book of Job, you'll find that he has friends or or friends, maybe I would say, who their theology could not comprehend the fact that Job would suffer even though he was righteous and blameless before God. They couldn't comprehend that because in their way of thinking, the only people who suffer are people who have done sinful things. That's the only people who suffer. There's no way that if you're doing right, you'll suffer. And yet the, the book of Job uh, is evidence of the fact that you can be righteous, upright, and blameless before God. You can fear the Lord you can turn away from evil and you can still suffer in life but it also is a testament to the fact that even in the midst of the suffering of life in the midst of the losses of life in the midst of the low points of life and the valley and the dark places you can find yourself in life that you can be faithful and true to the living God and you can lift up your hallelujah and your uh, worship in the darkest hour of your life because God is worthy of our praise and service service to him we learn more i believe we learn more in the valleys than we do up on the mountaintops we learn more about who god is what he's able to do and when the hedge comes down whatever reason it may come down yet we can still serve the living god no safety net no safety net wait a minute jesus is our refuge Jesus is our mighty fortress. God is the strong tower that we can run to. This I know. In the end, God wins. In the end, God wins. And if I hold to him and live uncompromisingly in this old world, in the way of holiness, he will not abandon me. And though I may suffer loss, and I hope that I never have to walk through some dark places that I've seen others had to walk through or that Job has walked through. But even if I have to walk through the persecution, even if I have to walk through these dark places, I know that God will be faithful. I believe that his grace is sufficient. And so I will continue to lift up my voice. I will continue to lift up my heart in worship to him. Praise the Lord. Job chapter 23, verse 10. But he knows the way that I take. When he has tried me, I shall come out as gold. I shall make it through with gold. Let me share this story with you in closing. Uh, in 1799, Conrad Reed, uh, a guy from North Carolina, discovered a 17-pound rock fishing while he was fishing in Little Meadow Creek. His family, uh, it was an interesting kind of rock, and his family used it as a doorstop for around three years. In 1802, his father, John Reed, took it to a jeweler, and that jeweler identified it as a lump of gold worth $3,600. Now, this was $3,600 in 1802, all right? So it's an enormous amount of money. The lump of gold is one of the biggest gold nuggets ever found east of the Rockies. Until its composition was determined, its value was unknown. It, was, it, was ser it served as a doorstop literally for three years. It served as a doorstop because they did not even understand that the remedy for uh, the, their financial circumstances and, and the value that that stone had because it had never been tested, it had never been tried, it had never been evaluated for what the real value that it had was. But I want you to hear today, in the midst of difficulty, we begin to learn the value and the gold, the pure gold of salvation and its worth in our lives when we go through the difficulty. Romans chapter 5, beginning at verse 3, says, Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character, 
and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. It all starts, listen where it starts, it starts with suffering and so paul tells the church at rome that are suffering and they're languishing under the the roman empire and the persecution of the jewish people and the roman empire itself and all these things that are going on he's saying we can rejoice this doesn't make sense we can rejoice though in our suffering because it produces endurance and that produces character and that produces hope and hope does not put us to shame at the end of the day what we have is not to show the world look i'm rich because of what God's done in my life but what we have to show to the world is we have hope that will never put us to shame praise be to the living God and so this this day at this moment what might you be going through this moment can I tell you that suffering can produce endurance and endurance can produce character. And character can produce hope. And we know that those who have invested in hope will never be put to shame. Because the Spirit of God, the love of God, is being poured out into His people. I leave you today with the example of Job. That even though the hedge came down, his relationship with God remained steadfast. Would you stand with me today?